And we could be live at the moment. I'm not too sure. You know how these things work sometimes. You click the button and you kind of just wait and see what happens and when we actually show up to the people. But I think we're live now. So for everyone joining in, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am super excited because we have a legend here with us tonight. Someone that is huge in the fantasy genre. That's going to be Ryan Cahill. Thank you so much again for being here this afternoon for you, this evening for me. And if you are in the UK, a very, very early morning for you. So again, thank you so much for being here, Ryan. How are you doing today so far? Yeah, good. Thank you for having me. I think um, I, I don't think the word legend should be involved in this conversation <laughs> whatsoever in any way, shape or form, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think good. you yeah. are definitely a legend to a lot of people, a lot, I'm sure a lot of inspiring indie authors for sure, just because you know, how massively popular your books have become and for a really good reason too. So I'm just astounded that you are here with me tonight. I know uh, you probably get lots of messages hitting you up on your DMs like across all your social medias. So, um, man, it's like, it, it's so funny because I think to some people, when you say something like that, they're like, Oh, you just you're you're bragging and you know you're just talking. I'm like, no, it's not fun. Like you sit there and just <laughs> messages just get buried, and you go to this other section in the inbox, and there's like a hundred messages you have never seen, mm-hmm. and you just are like, well, I can't answer any of them now. You know, that's 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 how that works. They're gone. Time time is up. I recently just got to October in my email catch up list. Woo! Oh man, All right, so yeah. you're making progress though. You're getting there. It was September, so <laughs> <laughs> it's moving forward. Well, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Again, this is called The Book Brew. So we're going to be talking about books while enjoying some brew. So on my side, I did pick out four different beers. I'm not sure what you got on your side. So if you have something with you, let's go ahead and get started on these things. two things. One, I have to be a little bit careful. I'm about to go after this. I have to go and play a Beach Ultimate Frisbee League. So I can't get too drunk because I will hurt myself. Um, also, I'm not a huge fan. I like beer, but I'm not like a big fan of different types of beer. So instead, what I have is a pineapple and watermelon vodka. Oh, that sounds interesting. I have Rider's Tears whiskey. <laughs> I have Maker's Mark Cellar Aged. There we go. A classic right very, there. Very cool. And I have Green Spot Irish whiskey made in French red wine barrels. <laughs> So you're going to have a little bit of a pregame going on here, going to this ultimate yeah, frisbee. Maybe it gives you a little bit of an edge, though. You know? Your uh, frisbee I sounds the, awesome. The, I agree. the last time I was playing frisbee, I uh, I sprained my hand. And that was just before December and messed up my thumb, like, really badly. And it kinda, I couldn't write for days. So oh. hopefully it doesn't happen again. On my side, I have four different ones. I'm going to start with one of my go-tos over here being just a classic yingling lager which is in a bottle right i actually prefer it in like in my drinking preference for beers at least it's always going to be draft as number one for me usually like straight out of the 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 can or whatever you call those things the barrel i think that's the best tasting for me and then bottle and then can um that's my go-to right there so i think that's fair all I right, know, I've never heard of a classic Yingling before, but um, it must be an American one. It's the America's oldest brewery. Apparently, really? it's on here. That's what it's saying on the on the sticker right here. So if it's on the sticker, they can't be. You lying, know how it right? works. If it if it's there, it has to be true. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Yinger from Brian Wilson that over is. here. What he said. <laughs> what he said. And we got John A. Doug's in here too. Welcome, right, guys. Man. Thank you so much. So, cheers again. Hopefully, cheers. you're having a good day after this as well. For me, I'm probably going to go straight yeah. to bed after this because it's a little bit late over here. And uh, it's now... It's funny for me because 10 o'clock is when I start my second writing session. So, I think late for me is so different to, not, to most people because <laughs> I probably don't go to bed till about 2 or 3 in the morning most days. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, that is interesting. I think I actually yeah. want to get into that here pretty soon. But cheers. First question that I had for this entire thing was, uh, did you write your books intentionally 
knowing that they could be used as weapons. Because when I pull this thing out right here, this I could literally chuck at somebody, it would knock them straight on the floor. Like, so this thing it's actually from thick. these discussions that there's a scene in the second book where Ivan beats somebody to death with a hardback book. <laughs> so that actually came up when I was talking to Johan, Library of a Viking. Uh, we talked about it, and I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in the book. He is gonna beat someone to death with a hardback book. It's gonna happen, and he does. And I actually really like that scene. That's hilarious that that actually happened in in the series. That kind of reminds me of John Wick. I don't know if you've you've watched John Wick, oh, but yeah. So like you know, in the first movie, where they're saying, "Oh, he killed him with a pencil. He killed him with a pencil," and then they actually made him kill someone in a pencil. In like movie number two or three, they actually showed it. Favorite things ever is like number two. Is it number two? I can't. I get fucking lost now. It's number two or number three. I think it's number three, where he kills someone with a horse twice. Yeah. And then a a motorcycle too. Yeah, this guy. Yeah. uh, He's just John Wick, man. So I see we got some more people in here too. We got Bo. Welcome, Bo. Bo. We got Hanny as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. So. Now that we know, you are intentionally writing books to hurt people. I think it's always good to uh, see. That makes it sound a little bit different than the intention. <laughs> yeah. You're intentionally writing books to hurt people. Well, I think <laughs> people get hurt, and hurt people hurt people, but we're deep. We're digging into much deeper stuff there. Actually, going into of War and Ruin, like when I first came to knowing or I even seeing your books, um, at least on my feed, was actually from Library of a Viking, where he was holding all of your books like this, where it was yeah, just stacked up picture. like this. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, that book is absolutely huge. I need that on my shelf right away. And that's when uh, I made the pre-order, because at the time, it wasn't out just yet, or at least uh, A War and Ruin. And I remember getting this one in the mail. I posted a picture of it right, right away. And you were saying, oh, it's finally in, like, the masses now. When I uh, posted yeah. it on Twitter, I was like, yeah, that, that thing is huge. It I'm was so happy. a running joke because there was such a scramble to finish that book that the printers can be bad enough with trying to get the distribution right afterwards. So it was such a scramble to finish that book that the timelines for getting the print editions out were really, really short. And so it got released in ebook. And the print editions weren't out in the market for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. And it actually became a running joke over here <laughs> that no matter what happened, one of my friends would just keep going. I say, oh, we're having chicken for dinner. He's like, that's great. Are the paperbacks out yet? And he would just say that all the time, every day, because every second email, every message, everything I got, all the comments on every post I put anywhere on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter was just a comment underneath it. Are the paperbacks out? Are the hardbacks out? When are they coming out? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Please never let this happen again. Please never let this happen again. They're coming, I swear. And it's a weird one because it's a great um it's a great complaint to have. But when I launched the second mm-hmm. book for any of the other books, nobody had cared that much. When I launched the books, you know, the paperbacks never launched on the same day. And it was always a, a little bit afterwards, but there was never enough of a you know volume of people in for it to really matter. And then when book three came out, I was getting messages every day. Where's the paperback? Where's the hardback? It's like, I don't know. Please leave me alone. I think that's a good problem to have, though. People, that's a great problem to have. People want your story, me included. Uh, just as an FYI as well, I've read up to book number two. So I've read The Fall. I've le- read uh, A Blood and Fire. And actually going to those two right really quickly, um, The Broken Binding Team. Those yes. books, the special editions, look absolutely stunning especially the fall when you said uh when you posted that picture when you're asking is breaking the internet a thing still i think uh that broke the internet a little bit in terms of the fantasy um, yeah that's people. an amazing illustration uh, i think i was the one by Rene. he's just phenomenal it was it was stunning i think the uh the green glowing swords just yep. instantly took people and I'm like okay what is this what series is this, and how can we get my hands really on it? It's a really fucking cool picture. <laughs> I saw it, and I was just like, "Yeah, don't change anything. Don't do anything. This is perfect. We're going to take this right now. He's like, are you sure I can shit? No, no, <laughs> nothing. Don't touch Oh, wow. It. So that was the, uh, was that the first kind of draft that they sent to you? And you're just like. Yeah, so 
it's really cool working with with different artists who do things in different ways because with Rene, he was meant to he sent like a preliminary sketch of the armor of the knights and i was kind of okay maybe we want the aesthetic to change a little bit i kind of want more sci-fi feel armor because it's kind of like you know mm -hmm. space marine power armor and fantasy setting kind of thing um and then he went away with that and he was meant to come back with an update and instead we got an email and he was like i got a little bit carried away i was having <laughs> a bit too much fun and um, so this is a lot further on than i was it was meant to be when i sent it to you it's just like a finished illustration and i was just like take it done end of story no more oh conversation necessary wow. and he was like oh what amazing um so yeah it's really cool getting to work with artists no i bet just you coming into this as an indie author <laughs> and then <laughs> it made me whole again i think uh, that's a good way to describe it um I'm just thinking, at least if I was an author and you have like, it's, it's one thing to have your book physically, like you're holding it in hand, but then to see it transformed into the illustration that just takes it to a whole nother level. I couldn't yeah. even imagine that. So it's, it's, it's a weird happening. thing where I was, I was sitting here at my desk and it's strange that this is what hit me, but obviously the writing is, is amazing, but the writing is also stressful as shit. Um, but what was really special was I sat here one day. And I was messaging Omer um, about the end pages for the fall. And mm -hmm. I was doing a brief for him. And it was just, it kind of struck me that part of my job, legitimately part of what my job is, is sitting here telling an artist in Turkey while I'm in New Zealand <laughs> what I want to see in the dragons. And that's just really cool. Yeah. It's a, it's a nice way to spend your day. I think... Uh... At least since I've started this this whole booktube journey of mine, there's so many authors and people in our little community in the fantasy and sci-fi world that are just across the globe. Almost everyone I've talked to in one of these sessions here in the book brew, everyone has been international besides Christopher Rocchio and another, another booktuber um, named Christopher as well, which is funny. Yeah. But everyone has been international. I think it's amazing how we can just talk almost instantly with anyone now and work oh yeah collaborate like you're just saying being able to talk on someone in turkey and get their amazing work to you where you're in new zealand at the moment i mean i'm over here in florida and we're talking right That's now i, think I it's was amazing. in new zealand i was in new zealand the cover artist is in korea and papers are omer in turkey oh, randy's wow. in barcelona in spain uh, felix is in i think san francisco rene is in germany they're like it's it's all all across the world it's amazing it's so mm -hmm. cool you're going into book number four now so i know that's the one that you're working on right it's yep. of empires and dust which has that super nice purple tone to it which oh, looks amazing so was that like your intention to go into each of these books with like a different color tone because i think the purple looks fantastic usually you don't see that too many purple covers out there so yeah, it, it, really it cool. wasn't when I when I started the series, but as I was making the covers, you know, it made sense. Each one kind of has their own color, their own vibe. It's what most series do. Like you see, if you find the Lee's books behind me, like blue, red, green, like a lot of the primary colors, even Ben's blue, red. And usually if you don't have like complete custom illustrations, we'll follow that kind of color tone. Just get easily signify the difference in the books. Yeah, it looks fantastic. And I was looking at your website too, which is absolutely stunning, by the way. I love oh, how you have all these metrics that like outline your entire writing process. Um, almost like it to the level of Brandon Sanderson, where, you know, he is oh, I a definitely constant... ripped it from him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. Would that be something that you kind of recommend to like new and upcoming um, indie authors as well, is to have some sort of transparency on a website? And uh, one, I guess another question after this, I'll ask it after you answer. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's all good. I was going to ask, um, did you create the website yourself or did you hire someone? Because that thing is beautiful. Um, no, looks... I created the website myself. Um, wow. One of many things that I have to learn when I started. But I think the thing is as well is I think as people and as humans, we have an ability, we have an inability to see a process and only to see an end result. So like a lot of people will see a website, oh my God, it's amazing. You know, it's, how could you be able to do this? And 
And even if I give advice or I give something on my books, they're like, oh, that's, that's all well and good for you to say because like, when you do this, your books will sell no matter what. And I was like, yeah, but like three years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, I had trouble selling 50 numbered copies that I made myself. It took weeks to sell them. Um, but with the website as well, it went through so many shit iterations. <laughs> it looked <laughs> terrible for it. And it's, the website is just building it and then slowly tweaking and changing and building like a brand coherency and deciding what I want with it. And the chances are in a year or two years, it's going to look completely different again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go back to it and just want to change something and then spend two days procrastinating and change the whole thing. That's definitely going to happen. And I think with the, with the progress counters, I think it's like a lot of advice when it comes to sort of stuff is it kind of just depends on you. Like it happened with me organically. So sometimes things are a good idea and sometimes they can just really seem manufactured. So it just depends. Like it happened that I was writing and I was just, I was writing so much and I had different things going on and people asking questions that I remembered Brandon Sanderson doing a progress update and I was like, okay, cool. So maybe like I'll do something like that similar on my website. Mm -hmm. I'll put it up. And that way people, if I update it every week, then as long as, I think it's like with anything, when you establish a consistency with something, people assume it. So mm -hmm. if you put a progress bar on it and you update it every six months, people will stop looking at it. But if you put a progress bar and you update it every week without fail consistently, people will be will start to rely on it as a genuine source of information, um, mm -hmm. which has so many amazing effects. As you build a readership, you know, if people are constantly going to it because they believe it to be a reliable source and it's always updated, you get more hits on your website. If your hits is more hits on your website, it'll get recommended more on Google search engine. You know, the more traffic you generate through it, the more chance people sign up for your newsletter. There's so many knock on effects to stuff, but everything's consistency. You know, there's no point in having it if you're not actually going to use it. And you just yeah, got to remember that when you have it, that's something else to use. It's another thing to keep track of. It's another thing to update. You know, it can be a bit overwhelming. Oh yeah. So how how's that drink, by the way? Is it pretty good? This is really good. I love this stuff. I, they have a lot of um, like hard seltzers over here. They mm. had them like White Claw and stuff in Ireland, and they were horrible. But these are <laughs> really tasty. Like, they were. It was like it was just um, sparkling water with alcohol and the slightest hint of flavor. And I hate sparkling water. But are you talking about the White nice. Claws being? Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of those either. So. No, I hate them, but I love these. Great. <laughs> I agree. Like that's a very tiny, tiny taste of flavor if you even get it. So, um, I kind of, I kind of, I've gone onto the the track of I don't want to be drinking my calories. I prefer to eat them. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's so you know you could have a a pint of beer could be three hundred and fifty calories, and a can yes. of beer would be a hundred. So it means I get to have three of these. You know, for the same one. So it's it's using logic. It's not it's not about, you know, not having the calories. It's about choosing where you eat them. When I realized that like a Magnum ice cream had the same amount as a bar of chocolate, I'm, I ate more Magnums, less bars of chocolate. Oh, yeah. I mean, if it, like you can game. swap it out like that, there we go. It's like uh, eating salad. You know, it's going to be uh, less calories than eating a burger. But if you eat seven salads, you're going to add it up a little bit. But Especially also, if the, uh, there's, there's, the there's a scale, there's a scale, right? That each one goes up and down. It's, your happiness is important. You know, I would rather eat a burger than six salads. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> no, exactly. Um, I guess going to that, one thing that I found that was pretty dang funny. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was making a video on like a bookshelf, not a roast, but more of a book a bookshelf appreciation where I was ranking a few different booktuber shelves and yeah. it was actually um library of the vikings shelf where he had all your books displayed on it like you know all the massive books right and uh, i actually saw that it was kind of warping it a little bit uh, that's amazing <laughs> i haven't seen that i have to message him i love, I think, I love johan johan's one of the first ever like instagrammers booktubers who kind of ever said yes to my book and uh, when i first started and I think people forget that as well. Like, you know, when I first started, nobody, nobody had a clue who it was at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm messaging people. I'm messaging Johan. And, you know, he decided to give me the time of day. And he decided to respond. And he accepted a copy of the book. And he, he read it. And we've become really good friends. I've met him at, what, two or three conventions now. And it's, it's really cool hanging out with him. And it's just, it's cool. It's cool seeing that. Like some of the people who gave me a chance when I started um, just also happen to be really cool people. 
Now I want to get into that real quick as well. After we get into our next item here, and just so you know as well, I like I'm not gonna drink four beers entirely because if I if I did, uh, we might be having a party at the end of this. So I kind of feel like, uh, considering the time of day it is or time of night it is for you, you should be finishing all four beers entirely. <laughs> My only excuse is I'm gonna play frisbee. Man, I'm getting a little bit older. <laughs> if I drink all four of these, I mean, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to be like, oh, my God. What you day is give it? A, you can give a child four beers in Ireland. That'd be fine. Don't do it. <laughs> cool. My next one, I'm going to be a little bit groovy this time because it's called a Funky Buddha Vibin Groovable Lager. See, this has become my thing that I'm, I'm unsure about. I see all these craft beers. And they have the coolest cans in the world. But I found that there's not a single one that actually lives up to the can. The cans are too cool. They get really <laughs> cool. And my expectations are up here. And I drink that and I'm like, that's a beer. That is definitely a beer. Yeah, I, don't, I expect these, it to like blow my socks off because it looks so cool. Some of these cans, like you're saying, look absolutely stunning. Where you want you want to put that image on like a t-shirt, you want to wear it somewhere, put it on a poster somewhere, oh, yeah. like in your back wall. But I definitely agree with you sometimes. Like you're so amped to drink this thing, thinking yeah. that's gonna be like mind blowing. And you're just like, huh, I'm not I'm not actually a fan. <laughs> so I like you can almost say that about books sometimes in terms of covers. Oh, that's, where you're looking that's at a cover. Thing. It's the whole point. It's part of what what's important about a book. I think what a lot of people lose. Uh, especially of indies because they don't have especially if they're new they don't have the, the industry experience to look at stuff from that perspective but it's the difference between um a cover that fulfills a promise and fits a brand and genre and a cover that's just a beautiful piece of art a lot of the time they forget they're like oh that looks very pretty it's like it does it does but its job is not to look pretty its job is to sell the book mm -hmm. and so sometimes that can happen where people see this beautiful piece of art but it doesn't represent what's on the pages because they just saw a beautiful piece of people get this beautiful piece of art in their mind. I'd love to have this for my series and you get it made and, and it just might not fit the, the genre. It might not fit the promise of the book. You know, if you have this, this beautiful cover, but it turns out your book is the darkest, grimmest, most blood soaked nihilistic book in the world. You're going to have some upset customers. <laughs> I go so, into yeah. that. When you were uh, designing or getting the cover put together for of blood and fire, like how many iterations did you go through that? Like, was your actual uh, idea what we have on the cover today? Or how, how did so, that look in the first book? There was a funny one because um, how I ended up getting these covers was a complete stroke of luck. So that second cover of Darkness and Light was actually a pre-made cover on Stuart Bache's website. So what he does is he designs covers for people, like big publishers, Mm -hmm. sometimes they don't accept all the ideas and if he particularly likes one of the ideas it doesn't get accepted he keeps it and so i actually saw that cover and i, I emailed him and i said this cover is amazing <laughs> for my second book but i would like to get one done to match it for my first and oh. my third so all i said to him was basically like i want a white black dragon egg and um, fit the th same theme for that and actually for the third cover, I don't, I don't know if I've said this before, but for the third cover of War and Ruin was actually originally called, before I wrote it, before I finished The Darkness and Light, uh, I think it was of Kings and Queens. And then, uh, and he had like a crown. And then as I wrote of Darkness and Light and the stuff took shape in my head, I was like, no, this mm -hmm. is a terrible name. And it actually goes back to the promise, a terrible name for, for what's going to happen in book three. <laughs> absolutely disastrous so we went back and we went through and did the third cover and that's a big thing that's promise on the cover like if you read of kings and queens versus you read of war and ruin your expectation for what the book's going to contain oh, is yeah. entirely different as soon as i released that cover people were like oh my god everything's going to die you know which is a very different reaction to if it was called of kings and queens absolutely that the tone is completely different even though it's only four words of yeah. war and ruin is so ominous and also the the red kind of paints almost like a uh yeah, something bad's gonna happen titles, here the so. last three titles don't paint a lot of good things <laughs> um i wanted to ask you real quick in terms of you starting out um 
did you, what's your first book that you actually published? Was it of blood and fire or was it the fall first? It was. So what actually happened is it's a mildly complicated question. So what actually happened was I, the first part of the fall was originally the prologue to a blood and fire, mm. the first piece. And then as I, as I read over it and see what I was doing, I said, no, actually this is a bigger story. So I separated it and took it out. And then I wrote a second part. And before I published a blood and fire, blood and fire was the first thing I, I then wrote. I finished blood and fire and I went back and I wrote a second part for the fall. And before I published blood and fire, I put the first two parts of the fall on my website as two short stories okay. uh, packaged together for, for free. And then I published a blood and fire. And then I wrote the next two parts of the fall and put them together as the full novella and then mm. published that properly afterwards. So it's, it's a weirdly complicated answer. Um, in their current states, it would be a blood and fire than a fall is the, pu the publication order. Um, but technically the first two parts were on my <laughs> website before blood and fire was finished. That's awesome. Yeah. When you first put it as short story on your website, did you get some people like coming into the website? Did you get some traction at that point or yeah, was it? So it wasn't just nothing happens for nothing. So I put a lot of time and effort into going on to story origin um, and a few other places and doing newsletter swaps with people um, where I offered the, I would offer my short stories as like a newsletter magnet for them. They'd put it in their newsletter. I'd put them in my mm -hmm. newsletter. And that was kind of building small bits of traction like before I published anything. Um, I, I find it really hard. I see a lot of people now are kind of say on Twitter and stuff and they're kind of building this buzz before they launch. Um, but I, I always found that really hard to do. So the easiest thing for me was instead of trying to build a buzz, it was like, here, just read this. If you, if you hate it, don't come back. <laughs> that, that's a very interesting point, actually, for because I'm sure we actually have a few indie authors that just now released a book not too long ago or are thinking on doing yeah. that here pretty soon. Like, What would you recommend to these new and upcoming indie authors in terms of uh, breaking into this this space, which is very challenging for a lot of people, especially with the amount of books coming out now, um, like what, what's like I, three things that you, you would uh, recommend? I would say now I have, I have an article uh, on the self published fantasy month on uh, loads of different things that I have and recommend and stuff as well. And I have mm -hmm. a couple of videos with say library of Viking and some with, with oh, cool. Patrick and stuff, but, but on top of that, and that all gives advice on things like pricing and loads of other bits. But on top of that, I think the main thing that I would say to anyone is just have patience just wait the people rush into everything and they're jumping they just want to get their book out and they throw it out without thinking and the reality is once your book's out in the world you will never be in that place again so once your book is out it's a snowball so if it doesn't succeed you're now chasing your tail trying to find a way to make it succeed and you mm -hmm. feel like all your dreams are dead even though it's only your first book <laughs> if it does and if it does succeed you now have to chase that snowball and you have to keep succeeding now at a pace that you're not used to setting. Um, and it's like with a lot of people who go into traditional publishing, they might spend five, 10 years writing a book. They get it, the book is bought. And then the publisher says, okay, cool. We're gonna need the second one in 18 months. Mm. And they're like, it took me 10 years to write the first one. It's <laughs> fucking bad. And so I would say, um, the, fir the first one for me is, is just have patience and wait. Don't jump on stuff. Take your time to understand what you're doing, understand why you're doing things and doing things purposely. And then I would say the second one is research your fucking ass off. Understand what you're doing before you do it. You know, have a, have a deep cognizant understanding of why you're doing things. And then it just, it's going to help. And then the third one is work your ass off. And I think it can be, it can be hard because people always, there's so much, different arguing stuff on, on Twitter and things. And I tend to just stay out of it. And um, because sometimes I, I think people take it the wrong way. If you say you got to work hard, they'll assume that you're saying that they're not working hard. Mm. And that's, that's not the, the concept of it. I was talking to another author when I was over in Sydney there and we were talking about it. And one of the things you'll notice is people talk about luck and people talk about hard work. All right. And you can get by on just luck for a little bit but it will catch up on you. So you can get just luck and you can have an amazing first book and it will come out. And 
But if you are not able to put in the hard work or you're not used to putting in the hard work, like that look will catch up. It's just how it works. You need to be working hard to be ready when luck strikes. And then also you can be working really fucking hard and just not get lucky. And that's, mm-hmm. it's, it's the way it is. But the only thing you can control is hard work, not luck. So, you know, work on the thing you can control and then just hope for the second piece. And it's like, you'll notice a lot of the time you see pe- people are really focused on, it depends what you, I, I'm trying to word it properly. With everything, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is just to write and have fun, then write and have fun. Mm-hmm. Screw everything else. You know, if writing is what you love and it's all you want to do, go and do it. If your goal is to make being an author a single income career, where that is what you do professionally, you need to understand that it has to be treated like a professional job. And sometimes I'll see a lot of advice. Oh, if it's not working, just stand up and leave. If you can't write, then just, you know, take the day off and it's not good for you. It shouldn't hurt your passion. I'm like, I do get that. That's the trade-off for your passion becoming your career is sometimes it will hurt the passion and you have to learn how to, how to find it again. But if you're working in the job, like in a big insurance firm or a law firm, you can't stand up and say, sorry, guys, not feeling it today. I'm just going to go home and I might be feeling it in like five or six days and I'll come back. You've got to sit down and you've got to fucking do it. And I have my goal of trying 2000 words a day. And I have days where I am not feeling it, like Mm -hmm. not feeling it. I'll sit down at 10 in the morning, nine in the morning, and I'll get up and do other things, but I'll still be at the computer at two in the morning, three in the morning, scraping over the 2000 word line just to make sure that I hit my 2000 words. Because I know that the difference between finishing the book and not finishing the book is making the word counts on all those days that were hard. The, the days where it's easy is easy. But, you know, six months later, if I put in two months worth of worth of like grueling horrible writing sessions that i hated i'll look back and i'll still have sixty thousand words from each month fifty thousand mm-hmm. words from each month and that's like for me anyway everyone's different and everyone has different circumstances because i have to make that caveat because someone will quote me and saying i'm being <laughs> whatever but it, it's like i think you'd never and my big my big, big one i always think of is you've never you never tell kobe Bryant to stop practicing oh man, you shouldn't be doing that all the time. Don't be practicing. <laughs> it's it, it, When you apply that same mindset to all creative endeavors too, it's the same. The more you do something, the better you get at it. Um, and the more you train yourself to be consistent, the more you can push through when times are hard. So I think, long story short, on a massive tangent, was basically what I'm trying to say is you got to learn sometimes to push through. And you got to learn... You got to learn your limits. You got to learn when you can push past them, when you can't, and you got to understand that if you want it to be a career, and the whole if you if you love what you do, you won't work a day in your life thing is bullshit. You will you will work harder than you've ever worked before. You will just be way more tolerant of it, and you'll probably be happier most of the time. But it's still unbelievably hard work, and it's still a job, and you have to treat it like a business if you want it to be a business. Mm-hmm. Well, basically now, since you are on the indie spectrum, right, you are your own boss. Um, oh yeah. You dictate your own, your own schedule, your own work ethic. When you but were coming into thing. this, did you intend that you wanted to self publish or did you say, I wanted to try out and find a traditional publisher first, or did you come into this thinking that, you know, you wanted to go on the indie side? No, you see, I actually, <laughs> this might sound a tad aggressive. I hate that mindset. I hate the mindset of, oh, I'm going to get an agent and try trad. And if it doesn't work, I'll do, I'll do indie. Mm-hmm. And I think when you think of it that way, when you think of self-publishing as your second avenue, as like a, like a backup option, just in case you instantly think of it as lesser and it will always be lesser, you know, when you, cause you're treating it that way before you even started. So, for me, what I, what happened was I was writing the book and I, I didn't even know really about independent publishing. And I was taking a, a look into it. Mm-hmm. And the more and more I saw it, the more and more I went, that is exactly what I want. <laughs> I am impatient. I don't want to wait a year for someone to look at manuscripts mm-hmm. and then another year or two for someone to decide they're going to publish it. And I, it's like, I, want it, I want this. And I sat there and I, I was like, this is my story. And I, I have a good concept of, of brand and I have a good concept of what I want. 
why would I do that? And I've said it a few times on, on podcasts and stuff before was I kind of made a decision that there was like two reasons I wasn't going to fail. You know, I could fail because I'm a shit writer. That's okay. Right. That's a totally legitimate reason to fail, mm -hmm. but I was never going to fail because I didn't work hard enough. And I was never going to fail because of somebody else. So that was the big thing for me. And I decided I wasn't going to query. I wasn't going to look for an agent. Um, I was going to do this. And at least if I messed up, then it was my fault. And that was the big thing. You know, I wasn't going to push it onto somebody else. And I wasn't going to say, well, I didn't do it because of you. It's I didn't do it because of me. It was it was my fault. Going back yeah. to your, your 2000 goal here. So I, it looks like what you're saying right now is that even if you did you know, 5,000, 6,000 words the previous day, yeah. you still have that I don't look at the 5,000 as, okay. as a let off because it's not. It's a great day. And mm -hmm. the 5,000 will mean nothing to me if I then don't write for the next two days. You know, and that's actually what happens with a lot of people is they write huge days, five, 6,000 days, 10,000 word days, and they won't write for a week. And then what ends up happening is me at my 2,000 words, I still get more words that month. Because if I wrote every day, seven days a week, 30 days a month, 2,000 words, I've hit 60,000 words. So even if you have a 10,000 day every week, that's still only 40,000. Mm -hmm. um, then it adds up over a longer period of time. But also I think I, I, I do try to treat it like, like I said, like a job. So I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write those words every day. That's just how it is. And I've tried to, like my current schedule is, um, I kind of switched it up now. So I'll kind of get up around eight in the morning. I'll chill out, have some breakfast. I'll go to the gym. I'll come back. I'll try and do some admin stuff. And then I'll write from like 12 to four or five, take my time off. And then my wife gets home. We get to chill out, have dinner, watch a movie, do whatever. She goes to bed around 10. And then I'll work again from 10 until about two in the morning. Uh, three in the morning and the only reason i'm doing that right now is because i have crazy deadlines for book four but the hope then will be once i finish this one i can go back and stop after that first session and um, this is just to make sure because sometimes i'll hit two thousand words two and a half thousand words before amy gets on and sometimes i won't mm -hmm. and right now i can't afford not to so i have to get back i have to go back and write and grind and get them done well, I appreciate you having some time with me today, and you got the uh, the frisbee later on, so that should be fun it's too. It's at four o'clock. It's at four o'clock, so which is the end of my first. Oh yeah, yeah so now it's my free that. time. <laughs> I got my fun time now. Uh, going back to what you were talking about earlier about you coming into this and starting out, when you were talking about how you're questioning yourself, maybe I'm a crap writer. Maybe you know we'll find out and just try. I that, right? still do that every day. I, well, I was going to say that when I was reading The Fall, because that's the first book that I read from you. Like, I know there's two different avenues you can take when diving into your series. Don't even and... get started. <laughs> uh, me personally, I read The Fall and I was like, I was blown away in terms of how cinematic and immersive this thing was, where you just felt like you were in this world, seeing these soul blades, feeling the dragon fire come at you. Like, did you come into that book like naturally writing like that? Or did was it like a. A, a, a period of time where you're working towards becoming that immersive or you just write That's like that just a day natural one. way that I've always written and I, I think I actually again this conversation came up when I was over in Sydney is what I didn't realize and what a lot of people don't realize is that different people see these things a totally different way and there was a whole thing done on about an, an apple I can't remember exactly what it was and so when people are told to think about an apple how do they picture it and, you know, on one end of the spectrum is this polished, gleaming red <laughs> apple with a white light on it and two leaves. And, and the other end is a green blob. And I didn't realize that people actually saw the green blob. I thought that everyone saw as vividly as that. <laughs> and so when I write, that's what it is. Like it's, it's a movie scene. So all I'm doing is I'm just writing what's happening on the movie scene. So I have the movie scene in my head of what's happening. And then that happens. And then sometimes... Sometimes when the blinds are open, sometimes when they're closed, I will stand up and if something's happening, like there's a twist of a body or a swing of a blade or trying to gauge what effect and um, what kind of momentum would come from a certain strike or blow, I'll stand up in the office and I'll imagine it in my head and I'll half act it out. Like if I was hit here, you know, at that speed, I turn this way 
And then what could I do with my two hands? Where would they go? And try and logic out where things would be. Because I think sometimes instead of describing every single blow, if the logical momentum of action occurs, then you can kind of skip a few steps as to what happens next and people will Mm -hmm. just picture it. But that's just how I've always written everything. It's just like a, like a movie reel. And I'm just typing the movie reel. That's great. I know when I'm reading, at least like when I'm reading someone's facial expression or they do something like with their hands, sometimes I find myself trying to make that same expression myself so I can like picture it or feel it in my mind sometimes. Like someone's scowling, I try to make a scowling face or someone's like pointing. I like, I just bring my hand up. We discussed this, that frowning means something different in the US. Yeah, so it means like a negative connotation. Everywhere else in the world, frowning is like you're angry. And in the US, it kind of means you're a little sad. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's apparently what came, I didn't know this. Um, and I, yeah, exactly. So that's not it to me. Like, I would never think of that when I frown. I would think of someone like, like angrily frowning. And so it just changed a lot of depictions of the word frowning in books for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. No, that, that's funny. Cause um, I know sometimes words from across the pond come across a little bit differently. There was someone I was talking to. I think, oh, it was Michael R. Miller who was talking about some some of his words in his dragon book. Yeah. Um, he's talking to you. Know, he's a he's a Brit, so take some of these words with a grain of salt. I think he even had a oh, special Michael, note. He is Scottish as fuck. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 That, his series is awesome as well. I'm not sure if you've read his yet, but a very different, they're both dragon books, right? But they're both different. Yeah. Both oh, different very tones. different. Like Michael's is much more um almost progression-y fantasy style. Um yeah. from everything that like he's told me as well. Um just different tone. And now I think it's a good point to move on to my number three. I think you might have already tapped into your number three. I'm not sure. That's my my seller aged maker's mark. There we go. On my side. It's not a crazy looking can like we were talking about a second ago. This is a brew dog hazy Jane, oh, no, brew dog. a New England style IPA, and yeah, brew dog. I, I freaking that was a spell. I love brew dog. Uh, actually, I've been to their brewery in Ohio, and uh, uh, it's a very cool facility. They have like a whole tasting room. They have a ho- hotel attached to it as well. You can bring your dog if you want to. You can chill out there. You can throw frisbees around too at this place. For Ultimate Frisbee is one of the most fun games I've ever played. It is <laughs> so, so good. It's like, a, it is, it's played like, I don't know if you've ever played it before, but it's like American football. So it's set out with two end zones and you are, the whole point oh, is yeah. to catch the frisbee in the end zone. Like it is, it is, um, except you don't, you know, break people to pieces. <laughs> I think he should put it there. That would be hilarious. <laughs> I would include the K, but I think we should put it there. Um, go into a character in your book, uh, Farda. This go. guy is so freaking hilarious. I, I Actually, I was interested in seeing if this guy's inspiration for you, was it from Two-Face in Batman? Actually, no. Um, and it, it, this is one thing I love because you see people, I'm pretty open like when people ask me questions about where things were inspired from and whatnot, because I always feel like it's part of my books, especially book one. Like book, book, book one was written with Dino. My, um, my computer oh, yeah. always does that. So like when I do this. Whoa. Yeah. That's so cool. I don't know why we discovered it because <laughs> sometimes if my hand just accidentally thumbs up like that, then let me see. Uh, it depends. It'll give a thumbs up thing. But um, yeah, like book one was intentionally written with the idea of it being a, a gateway into the series and a gateway of, of fantasy for people who maybe hadn't read fantasy before or people as well who wanted to kind of experience. I remember when I went back and read some of the books that I had read when I was younger and they didn't quite live up to the nostalgia that was in my head. And so what I wanted was for people as adults to be able to go back and, and to read this book and feel the nostalgia I had wanted to feel when I went and read those books. And that was kind of the idea when I was writing the first book was to, to get that through. So mm-hmm. with Farda, what actually happened was Farda was literally just a captain on a ship. And I was writing him and this happens sometimes I'll be writing and sometimes I'll get in the flow and I'm just writing. And then, then the next thing he flipped a coin 
<laughs> and 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 then all of a sudden, as soon as he flipped that coin, I stopped writing. And I went to one of my notepads and I just wrote like, you know, 400 years of history for this dude. And I was like, I know who this guy is, like fully formed in my head, know exactly what happened, where he comes from, how he feels about things. And that was just it. There was no inspiration for him at all. That was just a, a random NPC flicked a coin and became a main character. <laughs> And that is fully fleshed out and hilarious. Yeah. Wow. Does that happen that often so when you're often. writing or are your outlines usually very set in stone to where you don't deviate that much? So is there a lot of like this random creativity that has come to your mind when you're writing? Yeah. So when I write, what I do is before I start, I always know the ending. So I, I always know the last line of a book before I start the book, because what that does is it gives me an end point. And it kind of like it kind of like lifts the bumpers up on a bowling alley, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. The ball can't oh, yeah. go too far either way. And um, it's going towards the end zone. So I usually do that and then I'll kind of pick, I'll say, oh these 14 major events need to happen. And these characters need to do these kinds of things. Uh, these things need to happen to them. And outside of that, there's no outline. Oh yeah, the last line. Right like, down the last 100%. line. Like I, I knew, I knew that in the first book, the ending of the book was going to be him flipping that coin, and I knew what the last word being spoken was in book two, <laughs> and I always know that because I'll sit there and I'll think of what it's going to be, and now in fairness, in this book, it, it kind of shifted. I had an ending in mind, but because I'm coming to the last two books all the things can still happen. They might not just happen at that place. So the ending kind of shifted for me, which is the first time that's happened, but I'm very happy with where it's ended up. But normally, yeah, I will know that the last line, at the very last line, and at the at the least, I will know the scene that happens. But all the other stuff, like when I go into a chapter, I know what's meant to happen in the chapter, but all of the conversation, um, none of that's planned out. I could say, they need to talk about biscuits. And... <laughs> You know, it could go anywhere from there. And that it does, it happens a lot. It's it can be where, like in my head, characters start to fully form is when you give them that freedom and you try to get in their head and try and find mm -hmm. out what's going on. That for me is where characters come to life. I guess it's almost like giving you giving yourself a framed narrative or at least a finish line to work towards when you're writing the story, right? I mean, you, you know the ending, you know where it's gonna start. And then yeah. from there, you, you're going to follow these you said, I know 14 the start, I know major the events. I know the major events that are so going to happen. It's just getting there, right? That, that's, yeah. that's in general, awesome. I know, and it happens sometimes too, because I have so many, especially you haven't read of War and Ruin yet, but there's a lot of points of view. Um, and balancing them all and pacing them all is really important. And so sometimes with some of the other characters, I might not quite know what their story is going to be in this book. I'll know where I want them to end up. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people always say, oh, the start of the book is great and the end of the book is great, but what about the middle? And so sometimes for those characters, I know where they start. I know where I want them to end, but they don't have a story. So I will, I'll be writing other stuff and I'll go back and something will click and I go, that is exactly how they get there. And then I'll kind of just plan some major things that need to happen. Yeah, but for me, that's the, what I always equate it to, like I said earlier, is like if you're bowling, and you put the bumpers up because I know where I'm going. It's right down the end to hit those pins. And then having that framework stops me. Those, those points stops me from going too far right or left, mm -hmm. which sometimes, cause I was again, talking to it to a friend, another, another author recently. And that's what they were kind of surprised at. They're like, Oh, so you never, cause I've never, ever, ever deleted a scene ever. So I have, which is oh, wow. rare as far as I know. Um, but it's because like I might take 10 hours to write 2,000 words where someone else might take two. And it's just because a lot of the time, by the time I, I get to the end of my draft or it, you have gone over it once, it's basically where I need it to be. And it just, it makes it a lot easier. And for me, the, the whole idea is I can't chase down, not can't, but normally don't chase down wrong paths or wrong ideas because I've already given myself that general framework to stay within. So some people I know might chase down a, a whole side story for 50,000 words and then decide that that side story was pointless and then delete it. 
And also sometimes my people will do that and find an amazing side story, which <laughs> is the downside to having that little bit of structure. But for me, the structure is like absolutely necessary. When you were coming into these multiple POVs, was it initially a little bit difficult to keep track of where all these storylines are going? Because I feel like if you're having, you know, three, four characters that you're writing, that it can be a little bit difficult trying to, in your mind at least, place all these guys out in a coherent story in your mind. Like, do you have like a tool where you write this out or you keep referencing back to the chapters you just wrote and be like, okay, this guy ended up here. I want him to go. How does that look like for you? It's mostly just my head. Um, my head and then I have my map. And like I started with a map and I know the map inside out. And for me, oh, cool. I just see where the characters are mm-hmm. and they're they're moving around the map. And I just, I know where they are. And then sometimes I'll go back and just, you can say, I'll recheck some of my chapters, mostly just to to reassess before I start what kind of emotional sphere that character is in before I start to write it. Because, you know, you could go and you write a chapter and the character is in an overtone of, of happiness. And you go back to the previous chapter and someone just died. You know, that, that would not make sense. So I'll mm-hmm. go back and read some previous chapters, make sure I'm in the, the same mind frame, make sure I know where they're going. But generally, I have a fairly strong idea of where everyone is. But also, so, that's what that's what, a, that's what your self-editing is for. That's what the second draft is for. So, like, when, when I read the, the quote from Neil Gaiman about basically saying how... The first draft is you telling yourself the story and the second draft is you pretending you knew what you were doing the whole time. <laughs> and that's very much the case. Like I'll go back and I'll write it and then I'll have, I'll leave notes. When I think of something, I'll leave a note. I use Evernote, um, which syncs to my phone and my laptop and everything. And so I will leave a note just to say, Hey, I'll have like a section going editing for when I do my second pass. Hey, you have like completely neglected this character or this storyline. Um, you have left a lot of hints in the previous book that this character was important and you just got carried away with other ends of it and didn't flesh them out enough. So when you're editing, flesh them out. And that stops me from getting bogged down in the book while I'm doing it and gets me to the end. And then in the editing pass, I can add those bits in and add that mm-hmm. tone in, you know, add the little connections in, which kind of like make the book. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's definitely working for you i'm loving the story so far everything that you got mapped out in your mind in the actual map i love it so keep it up uh my general, get... my general rule is if someone liked the first book because it's weird people talk about reviews and i, I don't i do not read reviews for the first book anymore good or bad i don't read them so if it's like you know a youtube something a youtube video someone tags me in uh, i might i'll watch it a lot of the time because i love people it takes a lot of time to record youtube videos and to edit them and you know, I'll always do that, but like, I don't go to Goodreads and read the reviews anymore because it's probably the only book that I'm still sensitive on because it's the first thing I ever wrote. And it's always going to be that little darling where all your mistakes are, every all mm-hmm. your learnings, all your teachings are in that book. So I kind of just, I kind of just skip over that book when it comes to <laughs> any kind of reviews or anything. Now, I think uh, you'll pretty quickly know if you like your book in the series so far based off of that first book. But I know we were just talking about there's two potential paths for someone to you know yep. venture into your series. I know you said, don't get you started on that, but is there a reason why not to get you started on these two different paths? I know it's oh, like, you because start people with argue ball. over it all the time. Oh, people are arguing. Okay. And it never stops. And it's, it's really funny, but it never stops in my discord all the time, every time. And so the, the truth of it is it was written with the purposeful of t- intent of being able to be read before or after a blood and fire. That's like <laughs> deliberately how it's written because it was written so that it could be an introduction to the series, maybe displaying what you might hope to see later in the series, the kind of power levels, the kind of chaos, the destruction of dragons and what the magic can do. And, but then it was also written so that at the, when people get to the end of the ebook, they can click through for a link and mm-hmm. go back and read the story. So when I was writing it, I was very conscious of making it accessible from both paths. And I never, ever, ever expected it to become like a reading order debate. <laughs> and it has become a very intense reading order debate. Now, either way, they're reading your books, they're reading your story. So oh. I think it's, 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 a good, it's a good debate. So it's just oh, that is hilarious that it's debated <laughs> so hard on that. Mm-hmm. I remember there's already uh, there's this first reader reading orders, there's rereader reading orders, and there's one reading order now. 
where basically someone has gone and said, once you've read all the books, you can go back. And what you do is you read the there fall. Okay? And you read the fall, <laughs> and then you read the exile up until the point where it becomes, yeah, and actually you read, yeah, open the exile right until the last part of the exile. Then you go and you read the ice, I believe. And then you switch over to blood and fire. And then on like chapter, whatever you switch back to the ice and then, and it's, it's intense. It's very intense. That's it's a cool way to read it, but I would not advise doing that if you if it's your first time. Uh, that kind of reminds me of Game of Thrones a little bit in terms of the last two books, because there's like the POVs are a little bit different in both of these books, where people are making like they give you an outline on how you can read these two massive books and in tandem at the same time, to where it's one huge story. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of yours, a little bit going. You know, I know that was that was one of the ballsiest moves any author has ever done. Like <laughs> it never, it felt weird to me to to instead of write the stories. Like I, I I could not do that. I couldn't leave entire sections of POVs out of a whole book, um, which is like one of the ballsiest things I've ever seen done. Like for me, I I don't know how he did it. I think he was just. So big at the time, people were going to read both of them anyway. Oh, yeah. There we go. So I think uh, it's now a good point point to get to the last beer, or at least last beer for me, the last drink, which this one that I'm saving is called Einstock something. Algerd. <laughs> O-L-G-E-R-D. It's a white ale. Which I actually had never heard of before. Me neither. And it has it's an ale brewed with coriander and orange peel. So Ooh, uh, that is a divisive beer. It sounds I like coriander. Very interesting. I've never Plus, put it with orange before. Look at that Viking on there. I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Oh no, it's, it's a cool kind. So I'm gonna try it out. I don't know how I feel about a coriander beer, and I, I like coriander. It smells interesting. It's not too bad. It's okay. a beer. It's a beer. Okay, fair. So I'm enjoying it. What's interesting, what's funny I want to bring up real quick is that beer specifically. Um, I was talking with a Matt from The Broken Binding where he was oh. talking about how the Broken Binding Press was like almost the result of a conversation between you and him over a beer. It's like, how does that result? And over a beer is a massive understatement. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, that all happened because I was on the phone to Matt and we were just talking for hours. And he ended up being, I would say, beer wasn't even involved. I think it was like three bottles of wine by the end of it. <laughs> um, and we just talked about doing a special edition and said, yeah, that'd be really cool. And he was hammered. And <laughs> um, but it was only maybe five o'clock in the day for me. So I was just having like a cider out in the sun and he went to sleep. And I kind of thought there's absolutely no fucking way he is going to even remember this conversation. <laughs> and like a true hardcore elite drinker, he woke up the next day, texted me and said, let's do this shit. There we go. And that's exactly what happened. That is actually really hilarious. That's a good well, story of, there. Our, our entire like coexistence has been founded around that. When he <laughs> when we had our first ever call, he wanted to take, I think, 15 copies of the first book. Okay. Actually, I think it started at five. And we were talking and he was drinking more. And as he was drinking, he was like, oh, well, I'll take 15 copies. And then it turned to 20 copies of all of the books. And um, there's only three at the time, I think. And then by the end of the long conversation, short, by the end of the phone call, he had taken 150 copies of every book. And I had started at about five or wow. six. And it was as he got drunker and as we <laughs> talked more, it literally multiplied by like whatever. It, it got crazy. And I ended up sending him like a first order of like 300 books and more than that. And 450 books and then by I just, I just got very lucky they, they just sold and as they were selling and i was pushing them then he needed more and then he got more and then they just kept going mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
And those special editions of, from them look stunning. I think I already said that once earlier. Maybe the viewers get into me. <laughs> yeah, that's, don't worry. The whiskey's already getting to me. I still have to go and play competitive frisbee. Actually, I wanted to transition real quick to you as a, a reader now. So are you, with you having these hard deadlines, having the oh, schedule no. from, you know, morning and then at night, do you have time to read as well? Like, how's that look like for you in terms of so of reading? My reading has definitely nosedived since I've started writing. I was probably reading, and I put it, I did not know there was a book community. I did not know this. I did not read for a community. I wasn't on Twitter. I wasn't on Goodreads. I've never in my life had personal social media except for Facebook. That's all I've ever had. I've never had an Instagram, never had a Twitter. It's always been only in a professional capacity. So reading was just reading for me. So I mm -hmm. probably would have read, I would say, 30 to 40 books a year. Um, Which is still a ton, though, now, by the way, for oh, a lot of people. It was a lot. It was a lot, yeah. But now I read maybe five. Um, and it's, it's a lot tougher. And I try, I do, I try and set, so in between writing, I try and set time to, to do my reading. Um, but then if anything else is planned in life, then I can't. So say for instance, today we have, we have this call now, and then I go to do Frisbee. So a lot of that, uh, individual time for reading will be eaten up and then I'll come back and have dinner and then it might come close to 10 o'clock. And then mm -hmm. when it's 10 o'clock, you know, I have to go back to work. So it definitely has impacted my reading, um, mostly because you'll sit there, even though I know that I need to keep reading, I'll sit there and think, why am I reading someone else's story when I could be writing my own? And the kind of writing guilt just takes over, which I, I think I know a lot of authors can um, sympathize with. Mm -hmm. So I, I, bet, I bet you're pretty selective in terms of which books you're reading now. Like, Oh, I have to be. In terms of 2023, yeah. since we're you know, just fresh into 2024, what were your reads for last year? Or at least what was your, like, your top two or your top one? What I read last year. So I read Children of Gods and Fighting Men by Shauna Lawless that I mm -hmm. absolutely loved. Uh, Sean is a gem as well. She's incredible. And I read The Way of Kings, uh, which is really funny because people, again, I was saying earlier, people love to compare books. And they're always really confident in their comparisons too, and uh, like hard compared to, oh, you stole this from this, and you stole this from this. I'm like, man, I haven't read that book. <laughs> like, I have not read that book. And it was really funny, like with the, the Knights of Acheron, like, you stole this from the, the Knights Radiant. I was like, I have not read Way of Kings. I only read that this year. Um, I read I read uh, The Way of Kings just that year, and I always say it was really funny, is they'll say, the Knights Radiant, whereas the reality in my head, like it was a very definitive creation of the Knights of Acheron, which was the Knights Templar, and I wanted the Knights Templar in like Warhammer 40k Space Marine power armor with like swords that were made from the soul of a god. And what if God was real and all this sort of stuff um, was kind of where I wanted these like super warriors coming from. And I'd never even read Way of Kings. And um, I was actually more worried that people were going to compare the <laughs> the Soul Blades to lightsabers. Dark. Oh, okay. Like, People kept saying, yeah, there was Shard Blade. I was like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. I have not read Way of Kings. And I was really worried. People were like, oh, my God, it's like a lightsaber. He has a green one. He has a blue one. <laughs> no one has said that. Not one person, not one comparison. And I was so worried about the wrong thing. And it's just, it's really funny how, uh, you know, people's preconceptions and people's notions just massively influence that when they look at it. They'll be, like, absolutely sure. Um, I saw one guy recently, and he was saying that um, I stole the name... Uh, Camelin from Camelin in the Wheel of Time and that I stole the name Argona from Argonia in Skyrim and I was like the the name Camelin actually come is actually named after Camelin from The Faithful and the Fallen who is my favorite character in The Faithful and the Fallen has nothing to do with the Wheel of Time at all um but even if it was it's not like if i was I putting it in it would be it would be like a reference like a homage for someone to look at it and notice it it wasn't like pretending an i made the name um and then argona i was i was like i've only played skyrim once and i never finished it i liked it but i never finished it and i just thought argona sounded really cool <laughs> and that's the only it's just really funny how it goes because i have no problem like i said um there are things like the the fades are called, I, they have other names as you go through the series, but I wanted to use the word Fade as a reference to one of my favorite series of all time. 
and yeah. because again like when you when you look back that kind of character that hooded shadow moving character has existed in many many different permutations you could have stole Tamlin from Sarah J Maas <laughs> yeah that that's hilarious like, that's you... the thing for me I love making I love paying homage to the series I loved because yeah, exactly you know, I think as a fantasy author you're always standing on the shoulders of giants those people have all come before you and there isn't really anything new. A lot of it for me is it's almost never about the concept. It's about the delivery and it's about how you, a lot of the time, the whole point if you've written your characters properly is that the entire story should be different because of what the characters are experiencing, because your characters should react differently to other people's characters. Um, and there is a, like, it, it's not really a spoiler. There's a conversation in, I think it's in book three, but again, it's not, um, it's not a spoiler for anything between like Dan and Kaylin where I allude to that, I love doing the kind of like little Easter eggs where he's basically talking to him and he says, you know, they talk about back in book one where Kalen picked up Eric's mantle, his, his cloak, and he went out with him. And he was kind of saying that that's where it all started. He said, this, this whole thing only started because you picked up the cloak. If Dan had picked up the cloak, he would have worn it and never went outside. It was his cloak now. You know, Risk would never have seen the cloak because he would have never looked up from his own book. <laughs> and it's only because Kalen, who was always going to return the cloak, found it that the story started. And like that's the way it should work for me is that these different characters should be real. They should feel real and their actions mm -hmm. should be real and their choices should vary based on their personality. So that's for me, it's all about characters always. I love that. It's funny that you, you mentioned that's like, Skyrim. And that that <laughs> character's name being stolen, like if you, uh, like if you didn't tell me that, I would have never known that that name but was in Skyrim. That's what I mean. It's our preconception. So this person saw, it and that's all it was. Yeah. But I do always find that really funny because it's like you can't call anyone Harry now or John or Jim or John because <laughs> those names are taken. I actually had one before where somebody accused me of plagiarism because my characters traversed a mountain pass, which was clearly um, plagiarism of Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> who I was not aware that token copyrighted mountain passes and <laughs> uh, that they didn't even get over, by the way, they have to go through Moria, but I, yeah, it's those kind of things. You can, you just gotta like, uh, look off waters back. You gotta just let it flow over you and keep going and have a good time. And that that's almost like saying that any, any dragon book after the very first dragon book ever written is just yep. a copy of that initial book. So, uh, it was, that is the way some people think. And yeah. it's it's negativity bias in, in that you could read 200 reviews where people say, oh, I love this book. It was amazing. Thank you. And that will make you feel really positive and really happy. And then you see one review mm -hmm. where someone trashes you and it just like takes over. It's the only thing. It's part of the reason why like, I just don't really read a lot of them. Um, I think someone was curious when I said I don't, I don't even read four-star reviews. And it's not because... I think they're not amazing reviews. It's not because I don't love them. It's because, like, man, when you're writing some of the days, all it takes is just the tiniest thing, and you could lose a whole day of writing. Like, you could read this four-star review that is amazing. And so this book is phenomenal, and it's brilliant, and you can be really thankful for that review. And then you get to one part where it, like, criticizes something, just, just the wrong thing for you that day, and you read it, and you just get nothing done. Like, I'll sit there in just this weird mood, and I kind of said to myself a while ago, I, I can't, if I want to finish these books, I, I can't afford to let that happen. So it's it's one of those where you don't really have a choice. Or like when you first had A Blood and Fire come out and published and available to the public, were you constantly like just refreshing that review, the reviews page there yeah. in, in the beginning? All right, who's Everything. reviewing this? Everything, orders, sales, reviews. I'd say I refreshed everything about a hundred times a day. <laughs> yeah. Wait, and and they weren't updating quickly enough <laughs> for them to make a difference. That's funny. Yeah, I would imagine yeah, that, I would feel the same way. way to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited for continuing the series on my side, especially into of War and Ruin, this absolute the beast book. right here. Also, is the fourth book going to be about this big too? I am thinking so. Yeah. Woo, I can't man. read for it to be bigger. Right. When you because... were looking at this, like on whoever, wherever you published this, whoever prints this out, actually, 
what, when you were actually getting this like estimated in terms of the page count, were they like, all right, that's too many. That's too many pages actually. No, or it was. Does yeah. it even matter? It's too many pages. The, so the printer only prints up to 1,050 pages. And with the same formatting as of darkness and light, it was going to be 1,400 pages. So it was going to be 350 pages over the max print cap. So I have to bring the font size down. And oh, what, I, what wow. I did do was I, I printed out the page to size and I slid it into the Wheel of Time books mm-hmm. to compare the legibility of the font size kind of on the basis that if the Wheel of Time can do it, so can I. Um, so it doesn't go smaller than like those books, but it's it's smaller than I'd like to have it. That's actually, that's really hilarious. I thought, the only time I have noticed really small um, fonts was uh, in a book that came out last year by James Islington, The Will of the Many, which is like, I think a 700 page book or a 600 page book, but the font size is so tiny that it's, this could easily be an 800 page book or more. So oh, yeah, I, I hate the will of the many, not because I don't like the book, but because it kind of dominated everything last year. And I was like, God damn you, James. <laughs> and it was just, it was, I was like, fuck, I should have, should have, uh, if you had waited till 2024, that would have been ideal. <laughs> no, I, 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 James, James does amazing work. And I have to have it just over there beside the Chronicles of the Bitch Queen, the the, new, the Broken Binding version of The Will of the Many. I have yes. to read it because I've not, everyone has said it's incredible. So I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I definitely recommend that in your five books that you're going to read in 2024. That's one that I would definitely recommend as well. well I want to read more. I'm currently reading Words of Radiance. Oh, there we go. Gardens of, Gardens of the Moon. And I also have this, which is an arc for... Um, the new book by Michael Fletcher and Anna Smith Spark in Grand awesome. Dark Magazine. So I have to read this as well. I said I'd read it and I'm really looking forward to it because I haven't read any of Mike's work yet, but I've read Anna's and I really love Anna's work. So we got David Hopkins in here, oh, who really is cool. also a fantasy author who uh, has a fantastic book that I just finished not too long ago. Looks like his local book bookstore is featuring Of Blood and Fire. So that is pretty awesome. And if I can remember. This is, there's a lot of stuff to remember at the minute. If I can remember, I think David can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've seen it on Twitter and I think he got Francesca Bayral to do a map. And I saw that and I was so fucking jealous because I tried to get Francesca Bayral and the timing. Um, I love maps and I'm never going to like, this is my definitive map. I want loads mm-hmm. of maps for the world. I tried to get her and the timing, she just wasn't free at the time. And then I saw David had a map by her and I was... Oh, I was so jealous. It's not even funny. Actually, going to the fall, this is the, the book that I just started reading, or when I first started the book. And one thing that I noticed is that you have these emblems here at the top oh, of yeah. each page. I mean, the top of each chapter, which I'm a, I am was assuming the emblem itself relates to a character in there because I know there is yeah. one that has like a little dragon on it as well. Like, where did you get these emblems from? I, this is prime they're quality all, green quality right here for a they're all custom yeah. illustrated um, and it's the same through all of the books so i have the icons and they will change so kaylin's icon and ella's icon will shift through the series depending on where they are and who they are like how their characters evolved um my, my brother actually custom illustrates all of them aaron yep there we go not that way people, people are always like Oh, what would it be? It's how good it is to have like an illustrator as a brother. I was like, bitch, I pay him. He wants so much money, <laughs> and he does not give free stuff. That's hilarious. No, I love maps too. I know. Um, um, whenever I, I see a map, I always reference it back when I'm reading the story. Like I go back to it whenever they, whenever I a city is mentioned, I look that city up somewhere that I'm like yeah. looking, scanning for. I'm like, all right, where are my characters at? And sometimes. I can't find it. I'm like, okay, I guess this is a, a lost city sometimes, but I, I love There's that. There's a few things like that in the books where there's cities that I don't really want you to know the location of yet, or I want you to oh, think about where they could be. On purpose. So the, the newer maps um, now have a bit more in them. They were always there, but now they're actually there to see. Um, but there's still some stuff not mentioned. There we go. One it's, of the best fantasy books I've read. I will take that. it. Is awesome right there. And I want to think back to David's um, 
question where he said, what do most people seem to notice on a second reading? Um, there's a lot. And that's kind of the way I tried to write it. Uh, I've done my best in the series to leave loads of things for rereaders. So you might not notice them on your first read. But then as you've read the other books, you come back and reference them and go, oh, shit. So like a lot of people don't realize, you know, when they get to like a war and ruin and the exile, they realize they love Belina. And they're like, oh, I just love Belina's character. And then they go back and they reread and they realize she was in the first book. And loads of them had never realized that that was her in the first book. Mm -hmm. And it's those small little things you go back and you see those characters that were there. And you didn't actually take in in the initial scene and now that now that you love those characters you see their name again and it sticks out um that's kind of like one of my favorite parts of any of the books is i always take my time in like my second or third pass to kind of make sure that i'm dotting these things through so that if someone goes to reread that it's worth their time uh, that's very nice of you because i know um i'm going through my reread right now of the sun eater series by christopher rocchio I've and he has about that series. He has things just like what you're mentioning, or it's almost it's not a flashback, it's almost a flash forward where you're you can tell this guy had an idea in his mind from very like book one that you're remembering in book four when I'm rereading the series. So hmm. well, I have I some that. of those now. That's that's the fun part. I'm writing book four, and there's moments from book one that are gonna come full circle. There's moments from book one. That could be innocuous at the time that as long as you leave that that's how you know okay so if you're in book four if if you can then read back in book two and three as well as book one like the whole way through and you can see the small references recurring then you know the author was intentional if you read back and you're not seeing those references in some of the books what that means is the author got to like their fourth book and was like oh this would be really cool i didn't foreshadow it really in book two and three <laughs> But it, it links back really well. Um, so there is a difference. It's always really funny because there's times when people like credit you with really intentional things. You're like, oh, man, that was such a fluke. And then there's other times where people get it spot on. And you're like, yeah, I, I worked really hard for that. And I'm very happy you noticed it. Awesome. Well, I don't want to take up more of your time because I know you have Frisbee ahead of you. But I just want to leave off one more thing with just giving you the floor to anyone who is watching this live right now or anyone watching this recording back, I want to give you the floor and talk about anything that you have on your mind. It could be about your books. It could be about what you're going to eat That's for dinner. So it can be about anything. So I'm just going to give the floor to you and uh, the floor is yours. I don't know if I like this. This feels weird. It's very on the spot. I'm sorry. What do I do? What do I say? What do other people do? You can just do like a little dance. I'm not going to do a dance. You have not got me <laughs> drunk enough for a dance. I would require three or four more drinks for a dance. I usually, Wait. they just talk about their books or where to visit their website or um, almost like an, a click to action or a CTA. What do yeah, you want? Like not, what do you want people to do? Um, well, in general, with this sort of stuff, I actually just prefer if someone has questions. I like to answer questions. And um, because this is the only opportunity that I get to do them real quick. If there's a quick fire questions that people want, I can answer them real quick. Um, because otherwise it might take three months to get to an email that you send. It could take a lot longer. And <laughs> um, especially if the email requires more attention, because then sometimes I have to go through shorter emails first and then go back. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, like if someone, no one has any questions, generally the coolest thing about this whole career is being able to say to my, my own mother that if you just Google me, you'll get some results and you'll find me, which is really cool. Um, I am the first result on Google, which is probably like the biggest thing that's ever happened. I looked it up and I was like, that is so fucking cool. So if you want to find any of my stuff, just my website is the best place to go. It has all the artwork for the series. It has the the, um, the free e-copy of the fall, mm -hmm. all my social media. So that's kind of how I run with the website. Read us of Empire and Dust lines, I saw Haney said. There we go. So I do have, what I've been doing is if you're on my Discord, uh, what I do is, it was meant to be weekly, but as my writing has picked up and I've been writing faster, it's almost daily where I will leave small quotes from the book as I'm writing it into the Discord for people to keep reading and seeing what's happening. Um, I'm not going to read them 
because every time I read them, I put on this weird received pronunciation English accent and I'm very conscious of it. So how long after you deem a book complete before it's released to the public? Not very long at all. And that is to do with publishing schedule. So I think the last edit for of War and Ruin was finished boom, right at the end, it started December and the proofread was finished by the start of January. And then the book was published on the 19th of January. So not long, not long at all. I usually, because, because the, my writing process, the way like I take longer in a day to write, I polish it more. So by the time it gets to the end, it's a lot closer to the finished product. So the editing doesn't take that long. And then I'll go to my copy editor or my line editor who will have that usually for about a month or so, depending how long it is. No, actually, it was my beta readers first. We'll have that for a month. And then I take all their comments, re-edit, and it goes to my line editor and she'll do it and she'll go through the whole thing and I'll take her comments and then I'll send it to the proofreader and she'll go through it and then I'll take all her comments and then basically it will get published straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think the most I've ever spent, even on like a 430-odd thousand word book, was about three weeks, four weeks to edit. Um, and I will usually kind of go from one phase to the next phase pretty quickly. I guess that's uh, one of the perks about being self-published is that you can work in that such quick timeline. Like you were talking about earlier, like when you can submit a manuscript to a publisher and they might not even view it for 12 months. So that was, it was a big consideration for me. I I'm not patient with that sort of stuff. mm -hmm. Um, Have you started the TV art yet? Also, thanks for the interview. I have not, I've had way too much. I have started. There's a lot of stuff going on this year. So I have started two other briefs for two other things, but not for the TBB art yet. I believe the schedule for that to start is somewhere around April. So loads of art. There's going to be a lot of pictures this year. I like the pictures. You keep breaking the internet, man. And uh, I love it every time. I'm just living my dream. All I got to do is keep (laughs) getting pictures made of the books. That's I live for that. That's like my favorite thing. Well, you know, right in your background too, you have what's that? That's a a blood and, a blood and fire right there to your your right. That's a, that's a blood and fire, and that's the fall. And they're both Randy Vargas. Yeah, they're <clears throat> they're stunning. What's this last question right here? Uh, do you make your a point in catering to a certain audience? Or reading level? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I just wanted to, when I was writing, I didn't want it to be too convoluted because I think accessibility is important in writing. Um, and I think sometimes people get overly involved in how complicated prose can be. And we use words that make us look like Joey from Friends. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that episode where Joey basically finds a thesaurus and it writes a letter. Um, you know, you have two incredible homo sapiens with oversized aortic pumps. Yours sincerely, baby kangaroo. And I think when I write, I do, I, I want to try and make it accessible while also trying to capture from a narrative structure. I want to try and capture that old style where it's quite descriptive and where it's it harks back to the epic fantasy we have, but also trying to keep it a little bit modern. Um, from a descript- from descriptive level, it's just how I write. I think with, with like I said earlier, it's like a, a movie reel in my head. I want you to see what i see and then at the same time i think readers will always put their own interpretation on it anyway Mm -hmm. like you know if i tell you a character is blonde and your head cannon has brown hair it does not matter how many times i say blonde you will ignore it (laughs) and you will give them brown hair and i've learned that and then if it gets adapted and they have blonde hair i'm like no that's wrong that's wrong Uh, see the way i look at things is i could not give a shit about those kinds of things. They're just not something I know when rings of power happened, I put a message in my discord because I have characters. Say for instance, if they're from a lot of it's based on geography and I have characters, they're from Nirvana. We usually have darker skin. That's where they're born. And that's where you develop darker skin. Um, but at the same time, if anyone sees any of the characters with any skin color, then that's, that's great. That's what they see it as. The whole point, I think there should be a blend between what the author's intent is and what the readers take from the story. And I could not give a flying fuck 
when something gets adapted like that. It's not something I care about. Like, because in capturing the heart of the story and following the story is more important to me than the tiny, tiny details. Um, a lot of the time with general common sense applied. If it's something that makes a massive difference to the story, it also it obviously matters. But outside of that, mm -hmm. the last thing I would ever want is for something good to turn into something horrible because people have more fun hating it than they do enjoying it. Yeah. Well, some which sometimes you're always gonna have now. you're always gonna have somebody that's gonna be disappointed or upset or unhappy with whatever, whatever product comes out. So I think it's gonna be almost unexpected now. That like, you're gonna have a little bit of hate sometimes. But stuff just gets lost. Like I have huge problems with the Wheel of Time series, and I will not watch the second one. But I cannot in my wildest dreams imagine that somebody would fixate on the fact that Tom has a guitar and not a loop. <laughs> How is that your problem? How is that your fucking problem? <laughs> that will always well, be the thing in my head. I was like, you are yeah. in the wrong priorities. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanna say. Thank you, Ryan, for being Thank here you. tonight. I hope you enjoyed your drinks over there. Hopefully it gives you a little bit of an edge now when you go play Frisbee later on. And uh, I can't thank you enough for joining me here today on my little YouTube channel. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you. It's been a fun time. I think yeah, after this drinking is, this is my favorite thing. All oh these. my god, sorry. As we're talking, I just noticed that you have the original covers of the hardbacks for Sun Eater series. Behind yes. You, and I'm, very oh. jealous. I'm very fucking jealous. Yeah, I... So for the Sun Eater series, I got lucky on that because um, I joined in when Howling Dark was available on Amazon. It's so like, you can go on hipster. there and buy it. You joined in before it was cool. Yeah, well, I joined in yeah. because of Mike's books reviews. Which, uh, he's the guy that got me in when I saw the cover Empire Silence. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this out. And I loved it. It was still available at the time. I bought that book. And then from there, I have, you know, all of them now. Um, that was so cool. So. I need to jump over you there because I saw them and I was very, very jealous. But thank you for having me on. I really love doing this. Uh, it's really cool to just chat to people about random shit, about books, about fantasy. <laughs> stuff that I don't get to do on the daily because I'm just in my office. So I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, man. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. And uh, have a good one. Peace, Peace. guys. Peace, guys.